Hello and welcome to today's Unicon webinar on the top management agenda for executive development. My name is Rob Deedle and I'll be your moderator today. I'm a director at MIT Sloan Executive Education and I'm delighted to bring you this webinar. Today we're covering a, a fascinating topic uh, based on a new report by the University of St. Gallen uh, that covers key conclusions on the success factors and best practices that set apart executive L&D champions. The report details how champions align executive L&D with the overall corporate strategy and in doing so may also perform better in financial terms. We're going to cover a lot of helpful information today and just want to cover a few housekeeping points beforehand. Um, you'll notice that you have a navigation panel. You'll be able to use this panel to submit questions during the presentation or at the end when we allocate some time for questions and answers. There's a question panel that you're able to type your questions in directly and I'll be able to relay those to our, our speaker today. Another reminder that today's webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the Unicon website. So if you or your colleagues wish to revisit this material in the future, you'll be able to do so by accessing the recording. Finally, just a reminder that this webinar is governed by Unicon's antitrust provisions. As with all our events, Unicon abides by these rules and provisions. And uh, here they are stated here in terms of how we adhere to the antitrust competition statement. Uh, with that, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our speaker today. We're very fortunate to have Winfred Raugrock. He's the Dean of the Executive School of Management, Technology, and Law at the University of St. Gallen in Switzerland. Winfred is also a professor of international management and the director of the Research Institute for International Management at, at St. Gallen as well. His research is in the areas of international strategy, corporate governance, and the role of the CEO, top management teams, boards of directors, CEO careers, and research methods. His papers have been published in leading scholarly and popular outlets. Final note that today's slides will not be available for download, but will be made available in the weeks to come to the Unicon website. With that, over to you, Winfred. Thank you, Rob. Um, a warm welcome to all of you uh, present today. Um, I think my camera is still on, so you can see that there's um, a real person talking to you, not some, um, um, some bot. Um, a, a real person talking about a real study that we uh, uh, that we did at the University of St. Gallen. Um, uh, it's the third time we conducted this study, uh, which uh, really has the purpose of trying to understand what are the practices, um, what are some of the best practices also at um, uh, leading corporations, primarily in Europe, not entirely, only in Europe, um, when it comes to ex um, uh, learning development, uh, leadership development, and, and particularly um, uh, f at the executive level. Before I explain what we did and what our main findings are, um, just one slide, I promise you, just one slide, uh, with information about who we are, University of St. Gallen. I, many of you will know us, uh, you will, many of you will have met uh, Marcus Frank or other colleagues. Um, we uh, have been set up in uh, 1898, uh, a period where many business schools were set up across the uh, United States and Europe, um, such as at Harvard, Wharton, and, and other schools. And um, uh, we are primarily focused um, um, uh, as a business university. We have a strong focus on business. Um, uh, we've got a school of economics, um, a political science, school of management, a separate school of finance. Finance is very important in our country. Um, and um, we've got a law school as well as a school of humanities and social sciences. And we, the executive school, are a separate school uh, at the university um, uh, as well. We work together with lots of research institutes and centers, uh, of course, with our faculty, as you have everywhere. Uh, we've got, um, um, I mean, you can, you can see some things here that I'm not going to, to repeat here. Maybe one thing interesting is we are a public institution, yet we are um, a, a funded about half, half of our funding um, we, we get from the private sector through, for instance, executive education activities. Uh, applied research and so on. Okay, so for us it's important to understand uh, what are patterns and trends, what are best practices at our clients. And uh, with this report, um, we try to understand that and, and, and using really academic type of research. Um, uh, you, many of you will know that actually there's not a lot of research being done, not no credible and independent research being done on how do companies conduct their L&D um, uh, of course, there's all kinds of things that we would like to know. I mean, how much are they spending? Will they, their spending increase or decrease? 
Um, that's information that maybe is difficult to find, but there's a lot of other things that companies are quite willing to share, for instance, because it allows them to benchmark to see how are we doing compared with others, what are our best our, our practices. And what we did is uh, uh, we tried to, we, we conduct a survey across companies in, in Europe, but we've also worked together with Unicorn, so we got uh, 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 replies from around the world, uh, from Unicorn schools, uh, as well as from outside, um, uh, w from your uh, uh, corporate partners, um, explaining um, uh, issues, uh, patterns and trends, challenges, and the purpose of this webinar is to report on, on, on some key findings, also some of our interpretation um, uh, that we that we uh, uh, derive from from these findings, the report is uh, will be available at the end of the month. Uh, will be um, uh, advertised via Unicorn um, uh, uh, channels uh, at the Unicorn website, uh, as well as the as, as well as the slides. So we're still finalising the last details uh, as we speak. This is like a sneak preview, and I um, I hope it, uh, it it will lead to uh, well interest and and also some interesting um, questions and discussions. So, um, uh, what are some companies that responded uh, uh, to our, our survey? As you can see, we had about 300 usable responses. Uh, you get a lot of people who respond. Uh, those responses aren't really very useful. Uh, they're just keen to understand what, what this is survey like. Okay, we excluded those, of course. Um, and these uh, companies include some companies that uh, you all know. Uh, at the top line, you see Nestle. Uh, probably um, uh, very well known out, uh, throughout the world. Um, <clears throat> the left of, of that is a company like Hilti, which is also a very specialized company when it comes to construction. Um, uh, there's also some, some champions within Germany or Switzerland. You can see companies like Randstad, which is a major a temporary um, uh, work company, companies like Porsche, General Electric, uh, happy to have the BBC there. Uh, and okay, pick your company, the company you like or like to hate. Uh, what we what we have, and uh, we have some separate slides on that. But in essence, uh, this is very interesting because we have a nice overview of different kind of industries, different size of companies. We, although I'm showing you here only the largest companies, we really have a combination of large and small companies, and we actually do not have a bias only to large companies. We really have both large and small companies um, uh, represented in the survey, which is interesting because it allows us to look at, for instance, are there differences that can be explained in terms of size of the company or are the differences that really are the result of industry-specific features? Um, and using, um, well, advanced statistics, we are able to control or sometimes also to zoom in into such differences. And I'll, uh, I'll, I'll I might mention one or two of, of, of those findings, but may, most importantly, the findings that I will present to you are findings that hold across the population, i.e. findings that are not dependent either on company size or on company industry um, uh, or a company's industry. Okay. Um, the focus of our study really is at the top of the organization. So it's not just about learning and development, which of course uh, ca captures the full circle of, of companies, um, uh, uh, but we re are interested in executive uh, learning and development, um, which, which really is that uh, uh, part of L&D that aims to get um, senior executive to the point of top executives where they can take over responsibility for a full business unit or where they can maybe enter the next step into the top management team of the organization, the executive committee. Um, and we're interested in particularly the role of the CEO and the top management team in framing executive learning and development. In other studies, we've looked at different things. But one of the things we found in our previous report was that uh, the effectiveness of executive L&D is so much um, higher if and when the CEO and the top management team are actively involved. And that's why in this particular report, the third edition, we're looking at and we're zooming into the role of the CEO and of the top management team. Now, we always start this, this survey with a couple of questions. And for instance, one of the questions we, we like to ask, um, uh, to some extent, um, uh, we know the answer. It, the, the answer has been very similar over the last years. It's very similar. How satisfied are you um, uh, with the state of L&D in your organization? So we ask four similar kind uh, of questions. And kind of long story short, 
uh, 84% of executives are really not satisfied. Not satisfied with the uh, level or in the ways in which their company is dealing with executive L&D. In the bottom of the of the slide, you can uh, you can see the uh, uh, the four questions that we that, that we asked there. Questions such as: Is your company a front runner in executive L&D? Are you unlocking the full potential? Do you meet your primary business school, uh, goals with your executive L&D? And are you satisfied? And um, uh, this finding is a finding which is um, uh, uh, consistent. Uh, we've we've done we we've posed the same uh, question um, in the previous in the two previous editions of the report. And roughly, the, the, the percentage is always the same, which in many ways is good news for us uh, because there's lots of scope for improvement and companies themselves see that there is a need to improve their executive L&D. Um, now, what we then did is we wanted to un understand what is it that those companies that appear to be more satisfied, that appear to feel that they are unlocking uh, the the full potential of L and D, executive L and D in their organization. What are they they doing differently in terms of structures, in terms, or in terms of strategies, in terms of structures, in terms of processes, in terms of, in terms of practices, <laughs> and indeed, very much, what is the difference? Role? Are there differences in the role of the top management team and of the CEO? And the answer is yes, there are some key differences. So, we define um, uh, a group of companies as L and D or executive L and D champions. And they meet the following criteria. The, these companies, executive L&D champions, regard executive L&D as a front-running organizational function. They do believe that they exploit the full um, uh, executive L&D potential. They do use executive L&D in order to support primary business co uh, goals. And they, they are able to secure executive support. So that's how we define these uh, champions. Um, and this is based on the data, right? So this is from the data we identify these um, uh, four characteristics uh, that set uh, these companies aside. Now, if we look over the years, uh, we did this study for the first time in 2014, and if we see um, uh, how many companies are, uh, uh, by this definition, executive L&D champion, uh, there is some good news, but as you can see on the left hand of your of your screen, the percentage of companies that consider themselves champions is still relatively low. Less than one in five of the firms consider themselves as executive L&D champions. There's a group in the middle, um, uh, so-called, we call challengers, uh, that um, meet some of these um, criteria, one or two of these um, uh, criteria, uh, that is, that are making progress, that are, if you wish, challenging. That group is increasing. And the group on the, on the, um, on the right-hand side um, of um, uh, novices is um, uh, declining, but as you can see, is still by far the biggest group, i.e. the biggest group of companies um, appear to not be companies uh, that are meeting any of those um, uh, 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 definitions that I indicated to you earlier. So a lot of companies are far away from being executive L&D champions. Um, so what we're what we're interested in is okay what um, um, uh, what set these um, what set these companies aside and does it really matter does it really matter to be an executive L and D champion well our data suggests <coughs> it does um, we've asked companies to make a an assessment of their um, performance vis a vis their peers um, and what you can find is um, uh, the, more, the, the important line here to look at is the, uh, the dark green line where you can see that um, mo most of the executive L&D champions believe that they are among the top 10 performers in their industry. As you can see, the difference between being either a challenger or a novice is really insignificant. So getting a few things right as opposed to nothing right doesn't really make a big difference. The only difference really appears to kick in if, you've, uh, if you're able to um, uh, make a number of changes simultaneously. <clears throat> um, for those of you who are, like me, a bit of a statistics nerd, uh, there is an issue here of a common method bias. Uh, we've asked them a subjective uh, performance evaluation. Of course, they do not know exactly what it is that we're looking for and how we want to correlate this. 
however, um, um, a, a research uh, uh, a scholar would say, well, there's a few issues you can, you can raise here. That's definitely true. So this is an indication. It's not hard, fast, fast evidence. But you can see the, uh, the 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 image is quite quite strong, and therefore we think this is um, uh, this is um, uh, valuable and uh, worthwhile to look into further. I think that's what we did. We asked all companies, irrespective of the state of executive L and D, what are some of the challenges you're facing. Um, and interestingly, um, there's a lot of challenges that companies share. Um, uh, for instance, um, uh, uh, many companies, um, um, the fifth line here, face issues of functional background diversity. <laughs> um, uh, new generation has different challenges. As you can see, really, the differences between, uh, for issues such as background diversity, new generation, uh, internal talents that are globally spread, and so these are really quite uh, similar. On the one hand, between champions, the dark green group, um, and on the other hand, all the other companies. So these are, if you wish, relatively generic challenges. However, we do see, see some differences when it comes to actually more strategic and organizational issues. Um, although champions also face the challenge of uh, having an overarching learning architecture, they are much less likely to face that problem than the other group of companies. So you can see the gap here is, 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 is quite considerable. The same holds for limited resources. Of course, every company feels when it comes to executive L&D, maybe L&D in general, they face limited resources. But as you can see, challenges and offices face this problem um, uh, more strongly than other kinds of companies. And finally, um, insufficient coordination among, across the uh, divisions of BUs. Again, it's an issue that companies face across the board. However, champions face less so. So it does actually matter. Companies that um, um, indicate that they're happier, that they're more satisfied, that they're more likely to achieve their objectives, indeed seem to have um, gotten a few things which are <coughs> under their control um, in order, unlike some of the things at the bottom, which are more, uh, which are more uh, often more generic. The new generation is something that faces all of us, irrespective of the, st the strategies and the structures we've got in place. Um, a key thing that we found, and uh, really something which we, we think is very telling, is we asked a couple of questions about specific tasks on the left-hand side. So who decides about budgets? Who um, uh, decides about setting executive L&D standards? Who launches strategic initiatives? <clears throat> As you can see, when it comes to the champions, um, um, in every case, it is the top management team. So the top management team at champions has responsibility. And at executive L&D champions, it is really the top management team that, that, that explain why um, or, or that live the strategic responsibility. Strategic responsibility at such companies res resides at the sea level. That is different for challenges and novices, uh, where it may either be with HR, it may be with business units, but there is a, there's a, a, a more dispersed structure. And if, if you wish, um, uh, sea level appears to be less involved and there's more delegation. <clears throat> so almost all champions derive, and that's what we, we asked them, almost all champions derive their executive L&D directly from their corporate strategy. Now that is really telling. As, as opposed to less than half of challenges and novices that have answered that they derive their executive L&D from corporate strategy. Now, all of, none of this is, is, is maybe uh, sufficient of, uh, in and of itself, but as you can see, we, we begin to see a pattern here emerging, a pattern emerging here of companies um, where C-level involvement is strong appear to be more effective when it comes to um, executive um, uh, L&D. Um, we're interested in, in some issues, some aspects where um, champions, executive L&D champions, um, uh, operate differently, and w indeed, what do top management teams um, uh, do differently? For instance, uh, there's quite some difference when it comes to setting the framework. 72% um, of the champions indicated that top management teams get involved in um, uh, setting frameworks, i.e. involved in designing executive L&D. Not in the great, not in the specific programs, uh, but in making sure that there's a framework in place. 
as a, as a next step, they're also more likely then to align HR, i.e. they work together closely with HR in order to explain um, this is the framework and hence HR, here's the task that we see for you. However, uh, and, and this is what we found, found perhaps even more, most interesting, this does not necessarily lead to a top-heavy, a bureaucratic, a centralized institution. What we found is that at the same time, companies that um, have set the framework at a central level, have aligned HR uh, with, the, uh, with the framework, then, once it gets to implementation, actually do leave freedom to experiment and innovate. Because there, in the right, on the right-hand side, we see the champions actually leave more freedom to experiment and innovate than other companies, than either novices or challenges. And in a way, this makes sense. If you have a, a, a framework in place, if you have your strategy, if you've, if you've derived from your strategy your executive L&D objectives, that framework is in place. If you've got HR aligned and, and HR understanding how to fit in that, um, uh, in that rollout, then it, um, uh, you can um, uh, leave um, uh, the, 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 the shop floor, let's say, uh, the, the, the managers in charge with more freedom because they understand how this fits in and um, how their specific program that they're running for specific um, uh, groups um, uh, can, can meet the overall objectives. So uh, even though you might have had the idea that um, uh, being an executive L&D champion actually involves more centralization, that is not necessarily the case. It is only the case when it comes to setting in place the policies, the strategies, and the structures. And the implementation can then be um, actually much more um, uh, based on uh, needs uh, as they appear. Um, another thing that we looked at is, okay, what about technology-based learning? I'm sure that this is a challenge for all of you. Uh, it is certainly a challenge um, that we're facing uh, in St. Gallen, and um, uh, our clients are, uh, are asking uh, us about all the time. And one of the things we find is that, um, indeed, companies are uh, requesting to um, or are using more and more technology-based learning. But this is not a revolution. It is an evolution. What we found, at least what the survey suggests, is that firms uh, still use by far, on the, on the left-hand side, um, a higher proportion of traditional forms, formats, Traditional formats could be class, uh, classroom teaching, could be um, uh, uh, basic coaching, uh, and so on, um, uh, and, and um, are using less technology-based formats. However, we also see another shift, and that's interesting. We see that the proportion of traditional formats is going down, whereas the proportion of technology-based formats is increasing. Yeah, this doesn't appear like a big jump, but in fact, it is 28%. So indeed companies are making the move and, and two, three years from now, we can well expect that this line, this 24% here, is well in, uh, in, in the 40s or maybe even 50s. Um, so um, uh, this is a, 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 real, um, a, a real trend. Um, we've also asked companies on the right-hand side, how many technology-based formats are you using? Um, and as you can see, um, uh, companies um, are using uh, let's say the 23 percent of companies are using um, one technology based formats uh, as opposed to 20 percent the year before again doesn't appear to be a, a small jump but when you look at it uh, calculate in terms of percentages is a 14 percent increase and um, uh, about 16 percent in 2018 of companies are even reporting to use at least two uh, technology based formats a rev not a revolution an evolution and um, uh, uh, I think that's an interesting, um, uh, an interesting finding. Um, uh, we've um, uh, asked a couple of questions, a couple of more questions about uh, what are the barriers you're facing when it comes to technology-based executive LNG. Um, as you can see here, there are plenty of challenges. But again, there's a difference. Champions um, are better able in managing or to bringing those barriers down. They're still facing the same barriers, but not to the same extent. So, for instance, insufficient feedback cycles. 
um, uh, that's a, um, a, a, ch a challenge that all companies are facing. However, only 50% of champions indicate they are fa facing these challenges, whereas almost 80% of the other group of companies are indicating they face this challenge. Um, the uh, lack of ability to integrate insights into organizational routines, a very familiar one, and the numbers are almost the same with um, champions, again, facing this challenge, but not to the same extent as other companies, i.e., what I've mentioned earlier, the fact that we have a central sort of policy and central framework in place with the right structures probably, but that's an interpretation, probably will also makes it easier for um, uh, L&D managers, executive L&D managers in um, at major corporations to integrate insights back into organizational routines, into organizational structures. Um, not the right infrastructure in place. Uh, the numbers are slightly different, but the same pattern here. Again, with a high, much higher percentage of non-champions that are facing this uh, this challenge, and um, a, 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 a challenge that I'm sure that you've all come across. Uh, I'm sure I know we have. Executives are not eager to use exact uh, tech-based formats. Yes, that is a challenge really across the board. But again, once um, executives understand how this fits in, uh, it's also easy to communicate. We're using this format because of these and these objectives. OK. Um, <clears throat> so um, I've, um, uh, I've kept this um, deliberately um, uh, very brief so that I hope we'll have some chances to, um, for, for, uh, for uh, discussion and, and, and Q&A. Unfortunately, the con first conclusion is many firms are not very effective yet in executive L&D. I could, of course, add the uh, conclusion that offers opportunities uh, for um, uh, all the Unicorn members, for all of us active in, in um, uh, executive L&D. Secondly, top management team involvement really is key for successful executive L&D. I'm sure you've also uh, observed that in the programs that you've conducted, at least we in St. Gallen have found that if we have top management team and or board level involvement, this really increases the effectiveness of the program. It just makes the program much more credible. And of course, that holds not just for us as providers of such services, but it also holds within the company. Third, new technologies matter. They matter more and more. Their importance increases. However, effective executive L&D is not defined by uh, new technologies, are not defined by technology-based learning. There will increasingly be a, a component of effective executive L&D, um, and indeed effective uh, executive uh, L&D champions are more likely to use technology-based formats but you can't just say, okay, you're, using, you're old school, therefore you're, you're, you're less likely to be successful. At least based on the survey that we've done, this does not appear to be um, um, uh, 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 the perception uh, of clients um, um, at the companies that we've polled. This um, 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 uh, brings me to a conclusion. Um, um, we are planning to um, make the report available both at the Unicorn website, also at our, our, our own website. Uh, the publication date is uh, November 26th. And uh, we will um, uh, be happy to share a, a free copy of the report and then also a free copy of the, um, of the slides. Um, if you, uh, you, you heard me use the word uh, we, uh, I did this study together with my colleague, uh, Georg Gutmann, who um, uh, really did most of the work. I, I, get the, the, uh, uh, I get to present here and I'm, I'm, I'm the face, but really Georg did all the work. So I, I, Georg, if you're on, thank you very much for your support here. Um, this is um, uh, uh, very much thanks to his, thanks to his uh, efforts and his analysis. Winfred, thank you so much for leading us through that very informative uh, webinar. A lot of helpful information and some interesting findings. I was wondering, do you get any sense of companies that, that make champion status that evolved from challenger or novice into the champion category? And if so, what did that journey or transformation look like? That's a good question. And um, as, as we indicated, unfortunately, the, um, the percentage of companies uh, that, are, that, that we've identified as executive L&D champions is relatively stable, is only increasing um, uh, slowly. So we do not have sufficient observations to be able to say something about the change. It's exactly something, if, if we, I mean, ideally a next survey will be much, much bigger and will allow us to uh, identify the companies that made that journey. At this point, I can't say, apart from assuming 
but that's based on what we've done here, assuming that this must have something to do with uh, a more active involvement of the CEO and or of the top management team, because that really is what defines them. And um, by definition, uh, it is companies that, that have gone through a realization that, ex that, that executive L&D is of strategic importance and that strategy overall, the overall corporate strategy needs to be linked with an L&D strategy. And so, so it, 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 by, definition, by definition, it must be companies that have gone through that realization that have tried to implement um, uh, that into their um, uh, policies and structures. Great, thank you. As you worked, as you as you conducted this research, uh, and you looked at the the, were there any commonalities in terms of the management teams, in terms of demographics or size or, or the composition of the executives, that 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 made them more successful at kind of achieving champion status? Um, I wish I could answer that question, but I can't because the we we asked we we, we set up the survey in such a way that. Um, um, we can, uh, I mean, companies can provide information without giving too many um, details about uh, in, internal information. Now, of course, we do actually collect information on many of the companies in the survey, but we do not know all the companies in the survey. Uh, we only know the names of those companies that um, added their names. Many companies have, have indicated we're interested in receiving the report uh, um, uh, once it, it's, it's been published. For those companies, we know that they've participated. In some cases, we do not know the company's names, and therefore we do not have a full overview of, of uh, top management team characteristics. It's exactly the sort of research we're doing, and I wish I could, I could answer the question, and uh, at this point, I cannot. Fair enough. Thank you. One of the, the slides or one of the, the statistics that surprised me the most was one of the earlier slides with the 84% of companies is not championing uh, executive L&D. What, what surprised you in the course of this research? Were there any other key points or, or observations that you made that really surprised you in terms of what you might have been expecting? Um, good question. I think... Um, um, I, we, I'm, I'm slightly surprised to see that that these two, that the other two groups of challenges and novices, have been relatively stable, and particularly that the, the number of challenges haven't been has not been increasing so rapidly. Uh, to me, that indicates that making the shift towards becoming an executive L&D champion really is a difficult one. It, 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 uh, and actually. Based on my experience, and, and probably based on experience of many of the of the listeners, um, it is one thing to have a an executive or a board member say, you know, uh, <clears throat> labor or or people are our most important asset, and it's something entirely different to actually live up to that ambition or to 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 operationalize that. Um, a lot of what. Um, um, uh, top executives and or board members are saying when it comes to people are our most important assets, um, can be limited to lip service. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, um, uh, there's not so many companies that have thought through, okay, um, how can we make sure to have the right people in all, um, so with these strategies, with these strategic goals in mind, how can we have the right structures and policies and then have the right people in order to not just implement them, but also to make sure that we can implement the future. There's maybe one, one other aspect sure. I mean, that, that I found um, uh, interesting, and that's this one. Um, uh, who is in charge? Um, uh, this, this, is, this shows that uh, at most companies, and again, it's, it's sort of, it sort of confirms at least our experience, uh, is, a, is a bit of, a, a, bit of a, a, a mixture of responsibilities. I'm sure many of us, m m many listeners, um, and many participants know this question. I mean, who is my counterpart? And and this is really what we see at many companies, where it's sometimes busy unit management, sometimes HR, sometimes it's top managers, or HR needs to get top management involved. Um, uh, it's a bit of a, um, uh, an, uh, well, a, a, a mishmash of responsibilities. And um, uh, I've would have expected more alignment or some more logic in, in how companies are organizing this. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. And we've got a question from the audience. You mentioned that the survey included a range of large and small companies. How small were the smallest businesses? You know, that's one of those questions I'm happy to ask. So we, we've asked companies, if you can see in the top left corner, um, both size by, in, by number of employees and by annual re, um, uh, uh, revenues. As you can see, the, the smallest companies, we, were, we had over 20% uh, with fewer than uh, 20 employees and almost 20% with less than 10 million uh, of revenue. So we really have um, um, a, 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 a pretty broad scope of um, uh, quite large and um, uh, uh, smaller companies. Uh, and as you can see here, since we're talking about it anyway, we also have an overview of um, uh, of, of different kinds of industries, uh, which, uh, of course, we tested quite nicely reflects the um, uh, sort of industrial spread uh, in the um, in the companies that we've covered in our uh, in our survey. So uh, we we although we have slightly higher representation of industrial in many of the countries that we covered, uh, this also represents the the, the slightly higher weight. Of, of industrial. So yeah, we have really have, have a, a nice mixture of smaller and, la and larger companies as well as different industries. Any sense of the ge geographical representation of the companies? The, th this is clearly a, um, a, a uh, uh, this is by far um, focused on Europe and within mm -hmm. Europe again the German speaking area is, is over represented. So that is true. Um, uh, we do not have um, uh, uh, as many data on the United States uh, we have a couple of U U.S. companies that uh, that uh, have participated. Um, other U Unicorn members, for instance, from Mexico, we've we've received some uh, some some uh, uh, responses, but the vast majority are from Europe and within Europe, German-speaking area. Uh, Winfred, I w want to thank you for taking the time today to share this information with us. It's been very helpful and very um, uh, informative in terms of what's kind of the, the look ahead for how uh, we can engage with top management and, and the executive level to really help drive L&D engagement. Any final thoughts, Winfred, before we sign off? No, I want, I want to thank you for, uh, for uh, your attention, for your interest in, this, in, in, in the study. Um, if at some point you have questions, um, uh, feel free to, to contact us. Um, um, we would love to um, uh, run this uh, study again um, um, in, in maybe two years' time. Uh, with with Unicorn, and um, uh, of course, if we can get uh, uh, more schools to uh, uh, to get involved, uh, the value for for the participating schools will also be higher. Um, and I'm looking forward to um, uh, to to an, a, a next round. But I'm also looking forward to your feedback on 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 the upcoming report. Excellent. Well, there are no final questions, so thank you again for leading us through today's webinar. I'd like to thank the audience for joining us, and just a reminder that the webinar recording will be posted to the Unicon website, and these slides will be made available via Unicon uh, in just a few weeks. So, Winfred, thank you again, and we'll look forward to connecting again at Unicon events. My pleasure.